In this video, we're going to talk about carboxylic acid derivatives. In the last one, we introduced carboxylic acids and their reactivity, um, but you can modify carboxylic acids to make lots of different derivatives that differ in their reactivities. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. First, talk about what the derivatives are, how they differ in reactivity, and then how we draw mechanisms for their interconversion. So, uh, what is a carboxylic acid derivative? So, a carboxylic acid, remember, is a carbon-oxygen double bond bonded to an OH group. If we change the nature of this group to something else that contains an oxygen, like an OR, or an NR2, or a chlorine, these are going to be different derivatives. So, Z, in this case, can either be an OR, or NR2, or chlorine, and these are going to be different carboxylic acid derivatives. Notice that there's no oxidation or reduction here. It's just um, 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 interconversion between carbon and the same oxidation state. So what are the different carboxylic acid derivatives that we're going to talk about? If you, if you have a chlorine here, this type of derivative is called an acid chloride. Um, and those are the only kinds of acid halides that we're going to talk about. So this is called an acid chloride. If the R group is O with another carbon-oxygen double bond. That's called an anhydride. If it's an OR and that R is not does not contain this carbon-oxygen double bond, we know that's called an ester. Nitrogen-containing groups are called amides. And a carbon-nitrogen triple bond, which differs a little bit because we don't even have a carbon-oxygen double bond anymore, is going to be called a nitrile. And we'll talk about those and why we consider those carboxylic acid derivatives um, towards the, in the last video. Okay, so quickly I'm just going to go over how you name these things because you might see these names per periodically cropping up. Acid chlorides are going to be called alkanoyl chlorides. So this is called benzoic acid. It's carboxylic, or it's acid chloride, it's called benzoyl chloride. And a simpler example, right, this molecule is called propanoic acid. And so the acid chloride would be called propanoyl chloride. Similarly, this carboxylic acid is called acetic acid, so we just remove the word acid, add anhydride, it's called acetic anhydride. So a three carbon or an anhydride derived from propanoic acid would just be called propanoic anhydride. Um, esters uh, one ester that we're intimately familiar with from the lab is ethyl acetate. These are named as alkyl alkanoates, and you want to divide the molecule up into two pieces. This came from the carboxylic acid, and this is an alkyl group tacked on to the end of the carboxylic acid. For example, if we go back to this example, that's propanoic acid. If we put a methyl on the end, that's called methyl propanoate. If we put an ethyl on there, that would be ethyl propanoate. Or if we put a propyl on there, it would be propyl propanoate or butyl propanoate. Notice that what we're doing is we're just naming these things as if we added an alkyl group to the end of a carboxylic acid. And similarly, um, for an amide, like if we had a three carbon amide, this would be called propen amide. So you just drop the E, it's a three propanoic acid, it would just be called propen amide. You see, you drop the oic acid and you add the word amide. I'm not going to make you name these things, but it might be useful to recognize the names and how, especially for esters. And the thing that's confusing about these amides is that we can have different alkyl groups on the nitrogen, so we name those as N-methylacetamide, meaning that we have a methyl group on the nitrogen, or N-N-dimethylacetamide, etc. Okay, so for the rest of the video, what we're going to talk about is the reactivity and how these carboxylic acid derivatives differ in their reactivity. So it's going to be really important that you know how to immediately identify what kind of carboxylic acid derivative that you have, and then how 
reactive is that carboxylic acid derivative. And we can understand the reactivity of these different derivatives in several different ways. So one way would be the stability of the leaving group, kind of like the more acidic, something is more acidic if it has a more stable conjugate base, right? And if we react an acid chloride, what ends up happening is Cl minus leaves, here acetate leaves, here an alkoxide leaves, here a negatively charged nitrogen leaves, right? So notice that the chloride is the most stable. It's the conjugate base of a very strong acid, hydrochloric acid. So that's a weak base. It's pretty stable. Acetate is resonance stabilized, so that would be more stable than a negative charge on oxygen. Negative charge on nitrogen would be the least stable, right, because nitrogen is the least electronegative, right? So that's one way to understand it. Another way to understand the reactivity of these things has to do with the fact that in each case, right, this carbon is the one that's being attacked by a nucleophile, as we're going to see here. So this is the electrophilic carbon in each case, right? Chlorine is the most electronegative atom. It's pulling electrons away, so this would be the, this would be the most reactive or the most electrophilic carbon. Nitrogen is not very electronegative, so this would be the least electronegative carbon. And it would make sense that nucleophiles would want to attack that the least. But the most important argument, and the one that we're going to spend the most time talking about, is resonance. Resonance really accounts, resonance is the best explanation for the reactivity differences here. So again, electronegativity just is explained by saying the more electronegative the atom is, the more electrophilic this carbon is, the more likely that it is to be attacked by a nucleophile. In resonance, though, remember that every carbon-oxygen pi bond has a resonance structure, right, where we can take these two electrons and we can make those an additional lone pair on oxygen. Now we have a positive charge on carbon and a negative charge on oxygen. So the more positive charge character this carbon has, the more electrophilic it is or the more reactive the overall carboxylic acid derivative is. Chlorine is not very electronegative. So while we can draw this resonance structure, it doesn't contribute very much to the overall resonance hybrid because chlorine is reluctant to donate a lone pair of electrons. It's very electronegative. It doesn't want to give up those electrons. Whereas we can draw the same resonance structure in an amide, but nitrogen is the least electronegative of the elements that we're going to discuss in these derivatives. So it's very likely to donate that pair of electrons. So this is going to significantly contribute to the resonance hybrid and thus we're stabilizing that positive charge on carbon, making this less reactive. Okay, so now what we're going to do is talk about interconversion of different carboxylic acid derivatives, right? We can change this nature of whatever this thing is, Z, whether it is a chlorine, let's say it is, let's just, let's just say this is a chlorine, so we have an acid chloride, and we want to convert it to a different carboxylic acid derivative. One way we can do this is by nucleophilic attack followed by leaving group leaving. So regardless of what our nucleophile is, it's going to have a lone pair of electrons and it's going to attack this carbon, right? That, and in order to form this bond, we have to break a bond and the weakest bond is that carbon-oxygen pi bond. So we get an O minus here and a chlorine, and whatever our nucleophile was is going to be bonded. We're going to call this our tetrahedral intermediate, right? But then what's going to happen is this molecule is going to want to get rid of this negative charge, and it can do that by reforming a carbon-oxygen double bond. But to reform that carbon-oxygen double bond, you've got to kick out something, and it has a choice. It can kick out chlorine, or it can kick out the nucleophile that we just added, or it can kick out R. And by far, the thing that's going to be the most stable with the negative charge is going to be chlorine, and so what happens is we end up with what looks like a substitution reaction where we, our leaving group is chlorine, except it's not an SN2 reaction. It's an addition followed by leaving group leaving to give us the net result of a substitution reaction. All the, me all the mechanisms are going to involve nucleophilic attack followed by reformation of a carbon-oxygen double bond and a leaving group leaving. There might be some proton transfer steps in there, depending on if you're under acidic or basic solution. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this video. So what 
can be a leaving group. And again, this is kind of confusing because when we talked about SN2 reactions, we only talked about good leaving groups. Now we're going to look at anything that's an acceptable leaving group and in some cases can be a leaving group in these reactions. Anything that has a Cl- minus or even an O- minus or an N-, minus, we're going to see can be a leaving group. What can't be a leaving group? Anything with a C- minus or an H-, minus. you're never going to see these things leaving. These are just too unstable. Carbon and hydrogen have about equal electronegativity and they're less electronegative than nitrogen, oxygen, or chlorine. So while these are stable enough to leave, these guys can never leave. And that's the theme that we're going to keep coming back to over and over again. Okay, so let's say that we want to convert an acid chloride to an ester, right? Here we have an acid chloride. We treat it with a strong nucleophile, right? Methoxide attacks the carbon. Just like we said before, we break our carbon-oxygen double bond. That gives us our tetrahedral intermediate. Now what happens is we want to get rid of that negative charge. So these two electrons come down. And when these electrons come down, right, then it has a choice. It can kick out methoxide or it can kick out chloride. But it can't kick out carbon with a negative charge. And Cl- is much more stable than OME. So Cl- leaves. We break this bond, and what we get is a new ester and chloride ion. And notice, chloride ion is more stable than methoxide, so th from a thermodynamic perspective, we're going from something that's less stable, a strong base, strong nucleophile, to something that's more stable, weak base, weaker nucleophile. Every single mechanism in this chapter is going to have a nucleophilic attack step, and a leaving group leaving step. But like I said, there could be some proton transfer steps thrown in as well. So how do you know when you're going to have a proton transfer step, and how do you know if you have a formal charge whether or not it's going to be appropriate? There's a very easy way to figure this out. You can never, ever, ever have positively charged intermediates if you have basic conditions and you can never have negatively charged intermediates under acidic conditions. So if you have an acid catalyst, you want to you want to avoid negatively charged intermediates. If you have um, a base catalyst, you want to avoid positively charged intermediates. So let's say um, we're going to talk about this reaction in the chapter. This is called hydrolysis of an ester. So you have an ester. Water is your nucleophile. So you get a carboxylic acid and an alcohol as a product, right? There's lots of possible ways that we can draw this mechanism and based on the slide that I just showed you, right, what one thing that could happen would be the nucleophile would attack to break the carbon oxygen double bond, but that doesn't happen under acidic conditions, right, because that would generate a negatively charged intermediate. So let's look at another possibility. Instead of water attacking directly, to create a negatively charged intermediate. This is going to be very unlikely under acidic conditions, mostly because we went from two things that don't have any charges to a molecule that simultaneously has a negative and a positive charge. Generating a negative charge results in a, a new negative charge generates a huge increase in energy in the molecule, which is going to be unlikely. But if you're already under acidic conditions, right, then you already have protons available. So what you want to do first is protonate the oxygen. So you're going to start with a neutral molecule, but since you're under acidic conditions, this can pick up a proton, perhaps from hydronium ion. And you have a positive charge to start with, so the net increase in activation energy is not going to be that high. You have a net positive charge here, and you have a net positive charge here, and you have a net positive charge here. So once we've added a hydrogen to our oxygen, now this carbon is activated towards nucleophilic attack. We attack that with a water molecule. Everybody's happy to get this tetrahedral intermediate, which is much more likely under acidic conditions. Under basic conditions, though, we already have a negatively charged species, right? So the negatively charged species can directly attack the carbon to break the carbon-oxygen double bond to give us this tetrahedral intermediate, right? Because hydroxide is so much higher in energy than water, we start off higher in energy, so the potential energy barrier that we have to overcome is smaller. Notice that here is our 
tetrahedral intermediate. And I said before, like in the SN2 chapter, we said you can never have a, a negatively charged oxygen as a leaving group. So why would it be okay in this case? Well, the reason is because we already have a negatively, negative charge on oxygen, right? So we have a negative charge on oxygen in our reactants. We have a negative charge on oxygen in our products. So the stability of these two sides of the equilibrium is fairly similar, right? So the equilibrium constant for something like this is going to be around 1, right? Because we have a negatively charged oxygen here, negatively charged oxygen here. These have about equal stability, meaning that the equilibrium is going to exist or there's going to be significant concentrations of each species under equilibrium conditions. The last thing I want to talk about is in the last step when you have a leaving group leaving sometimes you need to transfer a proton to it to leave. Again this is another example of our hydrolysis mechanism of an ester which we're going to talk about more in future videos but sometimes people are tempted to just show the oxygen leaving with a negative charge, right? But right now we're under acidic conditions. So under acidic conditions, methoxide is not a good leaving group. And in order to induce this oxygen to leave, we need to transfer a proton to it, which makes it into a much better leaving group. Now this thing can leave and it's neutrally charged, so everybody's happy. Okay, so to summarize, acid chlorides are the most reactive then anhydrides, then esters. Amides are the least reactive carboxylic acid derivatives. We'll talk about how we interconvert these and the reactions that these different um, carboxylic acid derivatives undergo in future videos. Okay, make sure you know the different carboxylic acid derivatives and review these and keep these rules for writing proper mechanisms in mind when you're writing any mechanism that we talk about in this chapter. All mechanisms are going to include nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaving, but most reactions also contain other proton transfer steps. Never generate negative charges under acidic conditions. Never generate positive charges under basic conditions.